And of course, at the end of the Latin mass, they say, ite misa est, go the mass is ended. Uh, so uh, it, it really means dismissal. Uh, so, but they still call it mass. Now, in, uh, in Syriac, uh, we have something where in some of the liturgical books, you know, uh, they'll say, Teshmishto Rose Kadishe, uh, service of the holy mysteries. Uh, but that can refer to all the sacraments. <clears throat> uh, in fact, here at the seminary, when we first try to get fancy, uh, we started talking about celebrating the divine service. Uh, but that sounds Protestant in a way. Uh, in fact, I think some of the early liturgical books, we, we talked about service of the holy mysteries. Uh, so we're back to the question, what do we call what we do? Uh, so I leave that up to you. The uh, uh, I I try I, I try to at least say divine liturgy or I'll say the divine service. Uh, I I always tell, tell uh, seminarians uh, that uh, the interesting thing in in in, in uh, contemporary Arabic uh, is uh, when they the word they take a des and make it into a verb. And they say, Yahanrun Addis, mm -hmm. which I think is a beautiful idea. Uh, because what they're saying is, the people are saying, we're going to make holy. Uh, so actually, it's a corporate act of the community with, with the celebrant. And it, it's a beautiful thought in Arabic. So I don't know what we're going to use in English, but maybe for the next century, you know. Uh, so any comments about that? Uh. So you mentioned Tishmishto uh, Drosa Kadishe, where yeah. does the bono come from? Uh, well, the word Korbono means offering. Uh, yeah, I Literally, know. I mean, yeah. so, uh, but uh, what does that tell us? Say, I'm going to the offering. You know. yeah. uh, I guess uh, it looks good in Syriac, uh, but... Uh, <clears throat> I'm saying I'm trying to somehow transmit that to English, you know. Uh, I guess if you want to say we're going to go to the divine offering, but I, I think in English it kind of would be very vague. So, uh, but of course in Lebanon nobody worries. I mean, <laughs> uh, true. No, but by that and I've told you this before, Lebanon, the Maronite Church, is the dominant church. Uh, and when you're the majority church, you don't have any identity problems. Uh, so uh, there's no pressure to say, you know, what, you know, what, how is a Maronite different from a Latin one or something? It's the Maronite or Maronite, you know. Anyway, to get back to more specific things, what I want to go th tonight, now that we've talked about the introducing uh, the, the Maronite liturgy in general, is to go through the actual uh, uh, first part of the liturgy. And uh, here again, uh, as I said previously, we can talk about two divisions, the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. But actually, you know, there's more divisions than that. So, for example, the liturgy of the Word really doesn't begin until the uh, Holy God, Holy Strong One. Uh, before that, it's not the liturgy of the Word. It's a liturgy of preparation, of purification. And so uh, you can talk about the, the first part being, a, uh, you know, an extended preparation. As I mentioned to you before, in the Roman Church, uh, they really have a very brief period of purification, you know, uh, whether they say Kyrie eleison, Christi eleison, or some other short prayer uh, of, uh, of purification. But in a Maronite church, especially with the Hesoyo, uh, we have a more extended period of preparation and purification, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, gives more, I think, uh, solemnity to how we get ready to clear our minds and clear ourselves of our our sinful inclinations in order that we can hear the, the word of God. So, uh, so it is 
uh, a little longer, but of course, as I mentioned the last few weeks, back before the, uh, back before the 1950s or whatever, uh, it was a very long period of purification. So anyway, uh, so now uh, I, I would refer you to your, uh, to your uh, uh, offering books and uh, uh, on uh, the right of preparation here, I guess it's page one, uh, you have the preparation of the gifts. Now, in my own book here, uh, you'll notice that I spent quite a bit of time talking about where the gifts were prepared. And uh, by that I mean uh, from page 29 uh, all the way to page 32, I, I discussed this whole idea of where do you prepare the gifts. Now you have to keep in mind that when I first wrote my first edition of the book, uh, we, did, we did not have the reform yet. And, and for several centuries, the Maronites had been preparing the gifts at the altar. And so, uh, so, the, uh, uh, so it was customary that they would be prepared at the altar. Now again, please remember uh, about the evolution that took place, not just in the Maronite church, but other churches, where uh, you no longer had that many catechumens. And, uh, and so uh, uh, the early uh, part of the liturgy became more sacred because you're dealing with believers, not with catechumens. And so it was natural to, uh, uh, to bring in other prayers. But not only that, uh, there came a time when the priest was not with concelebrants and was sometimes not even with a deacon. Although we point out, ideally, every Maronite celebration should be with a deacon. Uh, but uh, how do I know that? Because there was a whole separate book for the deacon uh, as part of the, uh, the liturgy. Uh, so if the priest is alone uh, at the altar, at the sanctuary, it was natural for him to prepare the gifts at the altar, at least at the side of the altar. And so, uh, so that was the, the original, I should say original, but that was the customary way to do it for several hundred years. Uh, so if you prepare the gifts at the altar, then there's no need for a procession. Uh, and that's why I have some of these items again in those couple pages uh, about was there an offertory procession or was there not? And when did the offertory procession take place? Uh, and uh, so you can read uh, the items there uh, that I present. Uh, however, uh, when the liturgical commission of the patriarch decided to uh, reform the divine liturgy, uh, they raised the whole question about where the gift should be prepared. And after a lot of discussion, they decided that the preparation of the gifts as such is a uh, simply that, getting gifts together with no prayers on them, so a purely a practical act. And in fact, I remember when they were first sending out questionnaires to all the uh, dioceses or eparchies, that, that was a question that came up. Who should prepare the gifts? And by that I mean, up until that time, it was either a priest or a deacon. Uh, and again, you can read my text there where it talks about the deacon preparing the gifts at the altar. But even when the deacon prepared them at the altar, he did not do any uh, blessings uh, or anything of that nature, nothing sacral. It was, uh, it was just preparing the gifts for the priest to then come and, and, uh, and present them. Uh, and in fact, they, in their questionnaire that they sent out, they raised a the question, uh, is it okay for a subdeacon to do this? or somebody in orders, or even a Latin, uh, pardon me, even a lay person uh, who uh, is a catechist. Uh, so they, they really wanted to demote the whole idea uh, of who prepares the gifts. Uh, but as, as you'll see, they finally decided uh, in, in the rubrics here to say, 
that the gifts could be prepared either by a priest or, uh, or a, a deacon or someone he appoints. So they kind of left it open a little bit. Uh, my tendency here, and this is just my tendency, to say that I think that this role of preparing the gifts could also easily be done by a subdeacon, uh, because that was really part of his job, uh, is to uh, do anything that has to do with preparations in the sanctuary. But uh, again, you know, uh, uh, certainly you, if you just keep it to deacon, you, know, you can make that judgment or whatever. Uh, or normally in a parish, most of the time, it's either going to be the priest or the deacon. <clears throat> uh, but you'll notice now in the preparation of the gifts, you have a very simple set of prayers. So here on page one, <clears throat> when the, the, the preparer is... Oh, by the way, at this point, the priest normally would not even be in, in full vestments. Uh, he would be in a jibbe and stole. Uh, the, uh, that also was a big discussion before. Uh, back at the time when the Latin missionaries came to uh, Lebanon, uh, they raised the question of why, why is a priest uh, preparing the gifts uh, in black? Uh, you know, that, uh, but uh, again, as I say, for them it was just a purely, at that early time, a, mini a ministerial act. <clears throat> So, yes. So, just because you brought up Jibbe and Stole, so historically the Jibbe was a part of liturgical dress versus an L, a white L? No, uh, Jibbe, my, my interpretation, people might argue with me, uh, my interpretation is the Jibbe as such is not a liturgical vestment. Mm -hmm. It is the, the, the vestment of a ordained cleric. Uh, uh, the uh, like street clothes, you mean? Like, no, I mean no. in Lebanon, for example, uh, the uh, the priest in Lebanon would walk around all day sometimes in his jibbe. Yeah, that's what uh, I mean. Yeah, just like, yeah. So like instead of the, the stole is what makes the difference. If you're wearing a stole, that is a liturgical vestment. <laughs> uh, but the, from I'm saying when I say my, what I'm saying here is that I'm not saying. Take this as gospel truth, so I can mix my metaphors. I'm saying my opinion, as somebody who's studied this stuff for the last 40 years, uh, I do not consider this should be a liturgical vestment. Now, I'm speaking here as a teacher. In practice, here in the U.S., in Lebanon, more so in Lebanon here, they do things we don't do here. Uh, should be is all over the place. And... Uh, Con celebrants wear the jibbe, even at official patriarchal celebrations. Uh, but uh, as I say, from my understanding, you know, you, your vestments are what you get at ordination. And at ordination, when there, somebody is cantor, uh, there's no prayer for the jibbe. Uh, the, so, uh, uh, but that's, again, I'm speaking as a teacher. Uh, you don't have to take this. I am not trying to contradict anybody else. Uh, but this is my viewpoint. Now, you'll notice when I'm con celebrating, I wear the jibbe too. It's easier. You don't have to worry about an alb and other stuff. Uh, but uh, that's my, my interpretation. What about, would you say the same thing for a tobiye? Tobiye... Uh, in a way, yeah, that's true. I mean, it, uh, but let me uh, hesitate because I really believe if you go far back far enough in Maronite history, uh, even bishops and patriarchs uh, wore a tobiyi as their mitre. In fact, if you see the old pictures uh, of the ancient uh, patriarchs, you'll see they're not wearing a mitre, they're wearing a fancy tobiyi. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, the mitre obviously comes from the Latin side, you know. The, the other Eastern churches don't wear ma uh, mitres unless they were influenced by Latin missionaries. And, and so, uh, so if you're going to talk about a headdress, uh, the tobiyi would be more likely. So that's why I hesitate to answer you, because it, it, it also ha can have a liturgical function. So, 
to get now back to good old page one of your Gurbono. Uh, the prayer over the bread is like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shears. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Obviously, uh, the, the word like a lamb led to the slaughter comes from the fact that you're dealing with a sacrifice. And you're dealing with uh, something that is kind of white. <laughs> uh, and the interesting thing is when I, when I teach my comparative liturgy courses, uh, this same verse is used by a lot of different Eastern churches, uh, Byzantine and others. In fact, as you know, in the Byzantine tradition, the bread itself is called the lamb. Uh, and so, uh, so that's a very common uh, phrase. Uh, when it comes to the wine, uh, it's almost like you're reciting a rubric. <laughs> In other words, you're describing what you're doing. I pour wine into this chalice and mix it with water as a symbol of the blood and water that flow from the side of Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Obviously, this is very uh, apropos because, you know, the scriptural statement that blood and water came out from the side of Christ. Uh, now, why was water added in, in, in this? Again, this goes way back. Uh, there might be different reasons. I never did any research on it. In your liturgy classes, Roman or otherwise, you might find some research on that. Uh, but uh, I don't know why they added drops of water to the wine. Uh, but they do. And we all do. Uh, now, in the, in the Byzantine church, they have a different thing, not so much at the preparing of the gifts, but later on before communion, they pour hot water into uh, the chalice. Uh, it's called the Zeon. And some people think that that was done in the, in the northern countries because the wine would freeze. <laughs> uh, but there's different theories. Obviously, the interpretations come flooding in that the Zeon is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, melts uh, the chalice, whatever. Uh, but I, I keep saying to you, you always have to ask yourself, why are we doing this? But anyway, uh, chalice, wine, a couple of drops of water. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the, the gifts are covered by a veil. And uh, the veil here, and you see this again in a Byzantine interpretation, the veil represents the heavens. And that's why you have this prayer. His glory has covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. To him be glory forever. Although the English here is not quite an exact translation of the Arabic <laughs> in the description here. Uh, but just a minor point. Uh, so, uh, and again, in the Byzantine church, the veil has that connotation. Monsignor, yeah. should this be done in silence? Or out loud, like the hymn of lighting is. You know, no, no. This, this see, this normally would be done. Uh, you know, uh, it could be done even before the congregation comes to church. Oh, so earlier, uh, you know, okay. see, that's the interesting thing. Once it is taken off the altar, then it becomes very secular. Because I said here in these these few words that the celebrant says. There's no blessing, there's no, you know, it's just preparation. Uh, so uh, it could be done anytime. So, yes? But still, it's part of the liturgy. Yeah, it's part of the liturgy. Uh, it could be done like hours before. Or like no, I'm not. Sometimes but in I'm, seminaries in Lebanon, they would do it the night before. Well, again, uh, I, I, <laughs> I, again, you know, uh, I, I don't... To me, that's kind of taking it too far, but I, I mean, you know, you, you don't want the bread to uh, get hard, and you don't want if you're using leavened bread. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if I would, but that's just a matter of choice. Okay. The main thing to remember is it's not done at the altar. Uh, in fact, in, in the original discussion, they talk about a credence table. Now, obviously, in some churches. They have side altars, so they prepare at the side altar. But uh, that is not 
required. It just says a table. So uh, once you have the preparation of the gifts, then we move on to the vesting of the priest. And uh, there were different prayers that were associated with the vesting of the priest uh, traditionally. Uh, you'll note here on page uh, 2, they talk about Psalm 51. As we mentioned last week, Psalm 51 uh, for centuries was part of the divine liturgy. Uh, but here, I guess, they present it as a prayer uh, of preparation. And then they also give you two or three other choices. Uh, after, for example, on page 3 and page 4. Uh, but then that final large prayer here on page 4 uh, is interesting. Because if we recall our discussion the last couple of weeks, uh, in the second edition of the Maronite Missal, uh, George Skandar prepared a prayer of forgiveness to be said by the celebrant at the beginning at the foot of the altar. And it was really, in a way, imitating the Latin practice uh, of having a confidior. If some of you know your Latin background, uh, of course, now you're all younger. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, I go back to the 1940s. So, uh, the, uh, so uh, he put in this prayer in a way to imitate the Latins uh, set at the foot of the altar. And the Maronites started doing that too with the second edition of the Missal in 1712, whatever it was. Uh, here we find it here as an alternate preparation, uh, a prayer for when you're, the priest is vesting. Although here again, they change it a little bit. They, they change a few ideas. But basically, it's the same prayer. So, as a priest vesting, uh, you know, you want to, uh, again, get your mind clear so that you can, uh, uh, you know, get ready for the, the celebration uh, of the Eucharist. Now, we move on to the, uh, on page 5, uh, for the lighting of the candles. Now, again, this is something that when I was a young boy growing up, we never had that as a, as a, a separate uh, practice. But I think it's a good one. And, and so uh, the, uh, uh, you have here this idea that uh, once the, the laity is in church and the priest is vested, uh, you know, and, and getting ready for the divine service, uh, that you would light the candles and chant an appropriate hymn. Now here again, it mentions here that the, the deacon lights the candles, but I would, I would say, I think a subdeacon could do that too, uh, because that's his job. Uh, again, in the uh, ordination ceremony, <laughs> the subdeacon lights the candles, part of his, uh, of the ceremony. And so, uh, so I, I think that that uh, would be a, a proper way to do it, too. Uh, now, uh, let's take a look at the hymn. Uh, I guess there's alternatives besides the one hymn that's here in the book. Uh, and you'll notice the first verse, Jesus Christ, O source of light, in you we see light, truly light from light. You shine on all creation. Shine your light upon us all. Grant us joy with your bright dawn. Uh, so uh, you're bringing in the whole theme of light. And it's interesting that he used the phrase here, uh, truly light from light. light. And that's taken right from the creed. Uh, now, I don't know how much you know about the background of the creed, the uh, Nicene Creed, uh, but that was an important phrase put into the creed. Because Arius had come up with the idea that, that the word of God uh, compared to God is a reflected light, like the moon and the sun. Uh, and so he was demoting the word of God. So in the creed, they came up with this clear statement, not true God from true God, but light from light. In other words, uh, that 
identical with the with God Himself. And so I say it's interesting we have this phrase here. Uh, then again, uh, in the second verse, uh, it follows the whole theme of light versus darkness, and sin is tied to darkness. Uh, and so you have uh, that uh, that uh, idea. And then finally, in the third verse, uh, it kind of drifts away and talks about Mary and her birth. Uh, and in the fourth one, it, it really gets away from light now and goes into the uh, uh, martyrs and so forth. Uh, and finally, uh, talk, and the fifth verse talks about uh, death and uh, uh, you know, are going to be raised and so forth. Uh, so, uh, again, the whole idea here is to take the practical event of lighting up the church and turning it into a, 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 a meditation, a holy meditation on the meaning of light as Christ the light and light versus darkness of sin and so forth. Any questions about that? Now, uh, we're going to get into the liturgy proper, and I would direct your attention really to uh, uh, the one we've been doing on Sunday recently, uh, the Exaltation of the Holy Cross on 606. So now here... Uh, we have everybody all now revved up, ready, and we have the procession. And again, uh, having a procession of the clergy and so forth, uh, the a hymn is chanted. Uh, actually, when I was doing my research way back when, uh, one of the uh, people who uh, commented on the, the Syriac church said that originally they had their processions in silence. But now, of course, nature hates the silence, so uh, uh, you, you, you have something chanted. Uh, again, please note with this entrance hymn, uh, the, the Maronite flavor here. Uh, Alleluia, Lord, your cross was taken from the tree of Eden. Father Armando could tell you all about that. Uh, but notice right away, your cross was taken from the tree of Eden. The, uh, the tree of Eden is the tree of life that Adam and Eve never got to eat of its fruit. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there was a legend that the wood of the cross on Calvary uh, was a direct biological descendant of the tree of, you know, uh, life. In other words, the uh, the acorn or whatever uh, passed all the way down uh, to Christ and uh, to the wood of Christ on the cross. And again, the idea being that Calvary itself uh, was the original location of the, the tree of life. I don't know if Father Armando has something to add to that or not. Uh, but. Uh, so again, it, it's, it's an interesting twist that you find here. If you just read the first sentence, you might not even think about these things. Uh, and your death upon the cross has granted new life to, the, to all the world. In its shadow, refuge can be found for the rich and poor. Notice again, back to the idea of tree. A tree casts a shadow. So now you have this holy tree. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that provides shadow and refuge. Uh, and then it's, it refers to the, uh, the prophets and uh, martyrs and ends up with, Alleluia, the cross is our light. <clears throat> In the next verse, uh, it talks about, again, uh, the idea of Christ on the cross being the Redeemer talks about Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, and uh, so it gives you this whole biblical basis. Uh, then look at number three, verse three. 
With the cross, we bless ourselves for Christ's protection. When the tempter comes to us with his deception and sees the cross, far from it he flees and hides himself in the darkest depths. For the Holy Cross is mighty and defends us. Now, the idea here is the cross as a brand. In other words, we are the sheep. We are the flock. And Christ brands us as his sheep. And so the, the brand of the cross on our forehead, whatever, becomes a protection. Uh, and so this is why they talk about the seal of protection. Uh, again, a very uh, good poetic twist here. Uh, in the same way, why do we make the sign of the cross? You know? Or why, uh, remember uh, St. Anthony of the desert, uh, when the demon was attacking him, he defended him, defended against him by making the sign of the cross. Uh, so, uh, so again, you have this interesting idea. Any questions or comments? It's biblical also, the, I, I guess, Ezekiel. So it's also biblical in Ezekiel. It's the same Ezekiel, idea, the same Ezekiel idea. have the mark on their forehead. Right, Some right, say yeah. The tower. Yeah, and right, example right, the right. Yeah. Then, of course, we come to the, uh, the entrance prayer. And uh, here again, this, I have entered your house of God, is from the scriptures. Uh, and uh, you find this in other liturgies too. So it's a very common idea of entering the house of God. Uh, now notice, and worship before your throne. Throne here being Bema. So I remember when we talked about Bema. The Bema can refer to a judgment, a, a judge's, uh, you know, uh, platform. Uh, and so you have, uh, but here we have the divine throne of God that we're worshiping uh, before. Uh, and then, of course, the next, pray uh, for me to the Lord. I believe originally uh, the celebrant was saying that to his concelebrants. But, of course, it could easily apply to the people in general. Uh, pray uh, for me, and so forth. Monsignor, yeah. <clears throat> so, it's always been done in Syria, great, that never changed, the entrance dialogue. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the, as far as I know, the, the one that's different is the one uh, that happens uh, uh, after the creed. Uh, that, Ethel Wat Medibhei, that was reserved only to the bishop. Uh, oh. So now they, they brought it here for the, the celebrant. Uh, what happened in the old liturgy is the priest said it four times. Uh, so, you know, he keeps saying, I'm entering your house. Uh, that's because we had all these duplications. So, uh, 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 so here at least he only says it once. It's just sad because, um, you know, parishioners, they have this all memorized, but I don't think a lot of them know what's actually being said. And it's very well, beautiful. Is, uh, yeah, but isn't it good that we have it in three languages now? <laughs> yeah. uh, so then, now, here's the point. We, 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 the, the celebrant and the uh, ministers are in the uh, sanctuary, but now with the new liturgical understanding, he is not at the altar. He is somewhere separate from the altar. So as I said before, when we talked about the bima, uh, we at least take the spirit of the bima and say the liturgy of the word is not celebrated at the altar, but is celebrated you know, in the sanctuary, uh, but in a separate position. Uh, and then, of course, you look on, on page 609, where you have a, a doxology. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you skip down to the bottom of the page, you have the congregation saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and good hope to all. So you got another doxology. Now, in a sense, this is a duplication. In a sense. Although it's natural, you know, if the celebrant is uh, uh, greeting the people, 
uh, he is going to start with some kind of doxology. Uh, again, the liturgical commission had a big discussion about that. And they were wondering whether they should have the, the longer doxology on Sundays and feast days. <laughs> and just the glory to, uh, glory to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit on, on weekdays. But as you can see, I think they decided we better keep them both together. Uh, and uh, again, you know, of, of course, in the Latin church and so forth, uh, you know, the glory is a, is a very, a very big, uh, you know, idea. Now, the, uh, the interesting thing here is how short uh, glory to God in the highest is. It's only three lines. Now, in the original missal, it went on quite a long time uh, in Arabic. <laughs> uh, so the choir now is cheated. They only get this chant for a, a minute and a half. Uh, Are they just the deacon choir just to make up for it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, now here's, uh, here's what it sounded like before. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. To men of good will, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Lord, open my lips, and I will praise and sing your glory. Set a guard, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep watch over my lips. Uh, incline not my heart to any evil, to engage in wicked deeds. Remember, O Lord, your mercy and eternal grace. Remember not my offenses, but according to your mercy, remember me. O Lord, I have loved the service of your house and the dwelling place of your glory. Praise the Lord, all you peoples. Praise him, all you nations. For, the goodness is, for your goodness is multiplied upon us. Truly the Lord remains forever. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Now that was the original you know, glory. Uh, I must say, I think the, the commission was trying to streamline uh, they sure certainly did so here. Uh, you know, it's a fait accompli, so it's done, it's done. I, I don't know if we needed the long one because they were adding a lot of stuff, but it might have been a little longer. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I'm sure the congregation doesn't complain. And it's certainly the clergy never complains. If something is shorter. Uh, what? Thank God for Sixtus. <laughs> <laughs> now, still here on that page 609, notice we have an opening prayer. And again, that's fitting and proper. Uh, you have it in all the other Eastern churches and you have it in the Latin church. Uh, and so again, you're, you're going to get the people tuned in to the meaning of the feast. And so here you have, uh, Lord, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and psalms. When you appear on the last day and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and your Holy Spirit forever. So it's talking about the cross, the glorious cross. Uh, which, again, I think is a key idea. Uh, the, uh, uh, as you know, in the Roman church, they only celebrate it on September 14, and that's it. Uh, we celebrate it for seven weeks. Uh, but notice it's the glorious cross, not the cross of shame, uh, not the cross of humiliation, but the cross that triumphs. And, and so, uh, so this is the common theme here. Uh, then we move on to the Husoyo. And uh, if you'll note here in your book, uh, well, let me, no, let me just add, I don't want to go too fast. Uh, there's two things I mentioned here in the book that I want to make one comment on, on each. Uh, page 32. Uh, I point out at the bottom of page 32 of, of the book, uh, that there used to be a diaconal litany said after the opening prayer, uh, a corozuto. That, to me, uh, <clears throat> could have been very traditional. 
by that I mean you ha certainly I think that's at the beginning of having the the litanies in the Byzantine liturgy. In other words, the deacon here, and it's the deacon, not the celebrant, uh, recites a set of petitions regarding the day, regarding the needs of the people, and recites it, you know, uh, to set the theme again. First you have the theme of the, the feast, and then what the people are, are petitioning for. Uh, I felt that it should continue, but I guess again the, uh, the commission decided uh, they don't need it. Uh, and so it was taken out. Uh, and then the other point is something we mentioned already here on page 33 about Psalm 51. And that is, it used to be part of the liturgy. Uh, again, the liturgy of preparation, and it was taken out. Except now you see it in Lent uh, in various ways. <clears throat> now, Husoyo, Cedro. Uh, again, this is very Antiochian. Uh, as I point out at bottom of 33, the word cedro means a rank, a series, an order. And uh, the whole idea here is there's a list of petitions. So it's like a rank, uh, like a marching, uh, you know, uh, army. Uh, husoyo uh, means atonement, pardon. Uh, the, uh, the word, uh, as I mentioned here, it also could mean the mercy seat of God. Uh, the uh, and of course it could also be a name for Christ uh, and so, uh, so because he himself uh, you know was the uh, <clears throat> the one who achieves mercy through his sweet smelling sacrifice uh, the uh, as we mentioned before uh, the Husoyo is accompanied by incense uh, again, for the purification of the people. And the Hasoyo, as we, we have it, has at least three parts. <laughs> it has more, but it has at least three. One is the, the opening uh, you know, prayer, uh, which is sometimes written in, uh, from the Greek word proemion, uh, meaning like the preface, the, the beginning. Uh, and then you have the, uh, the cedro itself, which has a, the first half of the cedro is uh, describing the meaning of the feast. And then the second half is a series of petitions. And so, uh, and it, it's very clear, and every hisoyo has that. Uh, now, the interesting thing is, the first, the proemion, the first uh, part, traditionally was directed towards Christ, as we mentioned before. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the argument is made that it, it's very much similar to what you have in the Hebrew, uh, the Jewish synagogue service, uh, of what is known as the 18 benedictions. And you'll notice here, uh, I have a, uh, a uh, citation here. Uh, to you, this is from the Jewish service. To you, O Lord God and God of the fathers, is fitting canticle and glory, jubilation and chant, force and power, splendor and grandeur, might, praise and majesty, sanctification and royalty, blessing and thanksgiving, now and at all times. So it's quite a very lofty uh, hymn of praise. So what do we have here uh, in our book on page 610? Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of the cross a strong fortress for his flock and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one, be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. So, uh, directed to Christ, uh, and uh, again, giving some kind of form of praise. You'll notice here, because of the feast, it talks about the wood of the cross as a strong fortress for the flock. So what is it saying here? Uh, the, the cross being wood becomes some kind of protective shelter uh, for the flock, for the sheep. 
Uh, and so it uses that kind of poetic device. Uh, a sign of the covenant uh, uh, for the salvation of his inheritance. Please remember, and we saw that in the liturgy today, uh, the anaphora of John Chrysostom, uh, the very the constant theme we have in our liturgy that we are heirs. We are heirs. And why are we heirs? We're part of the family. Which family? The family of the Father. Who's our brother? Christ. Uh, and so we have legal rights. As St. Paul points out, we're no longer slaves. We're heirs. And so we have legal rights that should be... Uh, you know, uh, fulfilled. And so we see this theme of heirs, inheritance, all over the place. It's a powerful idea. Uh, now, uh, to go to the, the cedro, so notice here, the first part of the cedro, O Christ our God, by your precious cross, you have given us perfect salvation and made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise, proclaiming, now they use a device here that is found in other Hesoyos, but I suspect that they made this one up. Uh, the, uh, you know, they like to bless it this, bless it that, bless it. So, blessed are you, O wood of the Holy Cross, for you've erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you united heavenly and earthly beings. How is that? A cross is a bridge. A cross is an axis mundi. Do you know what I mean by axis mundi? In history of religions, you have poles between heaven and earth. I'm talking about other religion. <coughs> so it's a connection between the earthly world and the heavenly world. So here the cross is seen as an axis mundi, uh, connecting the heavenly and, and earthly beings. Blessed are you, Holy Cross, for you fulfilled the words of the prophets, enlighten the apostles in their preaching, crown the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Notice here, top of page two, 611. Now, the word now, or therefore, or and so. And if you go through the whole book here, you'll see some kind of leading conjunction. And here it says now. So that leads to the litany. So you had the Byzantines have their litany. We have this part of the of the cedro. So you're saying now, O Christ our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense and look at the petitions. All, all started with verbs, uh, you know, uh, commanding verbs. Make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt. So make, exalt your holy church. Guide her shepherds. Exalt, guide her shepherds. Who are the shepherds? The bishops and the clergy. Adorn her priests with virtue. Purify her deacons. I guess they need purification. <laughs> Help the elderly. Educate children. Direct the young. Protect orphans, care for widows, and grant and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. And then it's kind of a concluding sentence. May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross. Again, the shadow on the great day of your second coming. That we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and your Holy Spirit forever. So that is your basic uh, Husoyo. And it, it's really, as I said before, what identifies our liturgy as part of the Antiochian and Syriac tradition. Uh, again, I believe the Maronites have a much larger uh, list of Husoyos than any other of the Syriac church. So, normally, after the Hesoyo, or uh, you have a kolo. Uh, and uh, the kolo is a, a hymn that is chanted by the people. And, uh, you know, uh, 
again to celebrate the, uh, the particular feast. I think we'll stop here. So see you all in two weeks. I'm